So good morning and good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Let's get the session started, shall we? Um, my name is Wei Ting. I'm the founder and CEO of ARC. Today, we're joined by our friends at Deal, Alex, and we're having a great discussion about remote hiring compliance, right? The question of are we hiring our remote team members uh, legally and compliantly, that's a great question, as more and more um, com companies are thinking about growing their teams remotely. The word compliance may sound overwhelming to some, but it doesn't have to be. So today we'll be covering all the great essentials you need to know and will help you reduce your risk as you continue to scale your organizations with team members around the world. Right. So we invited Alex of Deal to join uh, this online discussion because we share the same mission to empower the future of work. At ARC, we remove the friction of remote hiring by helping you find great remote talent. And Deal, Deal makes it super simple for you to hire and pay your remote team members. So at ARC, we believe the best developers are everywhere, not just in the Silicon Valley. So we partner with hiring managers to scale their team faster by helping you source great talent who are just as good as a developer sitting in your office but who just happened to not live in San Francisco or in the Silicon Valley. So you can go to art.dev to learn how we help companies like Five Stars and Spotify effortlessly hire pre-vetted remote developers. So ARC helps you source and connect you with great remote talent and DEAL helps you make the actual hire. So DEAL provides streamlined remote compliance, um, simple payments and automated invoicing backed by expert support. It is a frictionless platform for your remote team needs. And you can learn more at letsdeal.com. So for today's seminar uh, webinar, so we'd love to make this an interactive discussion. So please do ask us any questions anytime on the side. Feel free to use the general chat to share your thoughts and reactions. And of course, we'll be sharing the video recording afterwards. And now I'll pass over to Alex of Deal. Uh, well, thanks for the intro. I'm uh, very excited to be here with you. And yeah, we're going to learn a little more about uh, remote hiring in general, which you know may sound complicated to some people, uh, but it's not actually that hard. And more importantly, most of the time it's not done well. And this is what we're doing at the all day. We believe the world is going remote. I mean, we don't really need to believe it. It's really happening. And we want to make sure great companies like yours um, streamline a lot of those processes and mitigate a lot of those risks. So to give you a little bit of background, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm the CEO of Deal. Uh, we're a fully distributed company uh, backed by Y Combinator. My personal background, I am distributed myself, I'll say. Um, I was born and raised in Paris. I moved around, lived in Israel, in the US, in the UK, in Spain, and in a couple of countries. So I'm very much uh, I really adhere to the philosophy of remote work. And, and that really shows into our company, right? Today, we're 14 people and I'd say distributed in 10 different countries, I think. I've always kind of built products of my life. Uh, I've built products from consumer products to, um, I've even tried hardware a few times. And every single time I did that, I did it distributed. So I had the chance to really scale distributed teams and understand how they work from ground up. And today, when working on Deal, my, my idea here is to basically bring you a solution that really helps you from end to end, bring on your teammates and really give them an amazing experience on payments and on the hiring side. So talking a little bit about how to, how to hire, right? So there's different ways to, to bring on your remote team members. Um, the, the best and most compliant way is opening a subsidiary. Say if you have a US company, um, and you want to hire people in say, India or Europe or Latin America, the best, best way to do so is usually to open a subsidiary. But a lot of the time, specifically when working as a fully distributed company, it, it doesn't really make sense, right? If you have a couple of people in different countries, the overhead um, is pretty high. Opening the account is a lot of the time complicated. In some countries, you even need a nationality to actually open the company. So. It's a really good way to solve it, but most of the time not applicable to most companies in like ours. 
The second one is working with PEO, which is basically a third party company that hires for you. Um, you know, there, there are some people building streamless PEOs, uh, which could be really cool. But really, the idea of a PEO and, and what makes usually a PEO legal is the friction of having someone hiring some, that person for you, right? So they're basically running payroll and they become the employer and the employer of record of that specific person. Most of the time, it's a pretty painful process, um, but it is the second best option uh, when you're not going to open a subsidiary from a pure compliance perspective. And if you're willing to go through that whole process and willing to pay a pretty hefty fee because they're taking a lot of risk for you by hiring that person, then a PEO is usually a good option as well. And then what really happens most of the time um, is companies hire as independent contractors because you don't require a PEO, which costs a lot of money on both sides. Um, you don't need a subsidiary and it's, it's just a lot easier for both parties to set up. The problem is depending on your stage and depending on your expertise, you might not realize that there's a lot of risks to hiring as an independent contractor. Um, some of those risks are pretty common in track countries, uh, like misclassifications and regulations are really switching towards that, as I think we'll talk about later. And some other risks are a little less obvious, but very much there. For example, if you were to hire someone in France, where I'm from, you actually need work documents to be a contractor. If I don't have that documents and that structure, you're basically paying someone that is not paying their taxes right, meaning you're paying them wrong, which can at some point be pretty punitive when it comes towards the government. So there's a few things you need to know that when you're hiring someone as an independent contractor. Today, most companies, um, and I, I bet yours, uh, just send some general template agreement from your legal uh, advisor in your country uh, and just sends that out to, to, the, to the actual contractor and have them sign it. The thing is there's lots of different clauses and a lot of different rules that change from a country to the other. And one contract never really fits it all. Uh, when it comes to independent contractor hiring, there's lots of tips you can have. So for example, you know, very much defining the scope of work to make it very, very direct and broken down into goals helps towards misclassification and not having that risk. In some countries, for example, you have other types of risk like in Russia or in China where the IP clauses are very different than in the US. And that's something else that you need to be wary of. There's very much uh, a different clause per country at least. Uh, so you know, I'm not gonna get into the details of every single one of those countries, but down the line, if you really have a good lawyer, what they will tell you is what they will tell you is go get a local advisor in a specific country if you want to do this right. Um, and the reality is most of us don't really do that. The second thing is that document collection piece that I was kind of talking about before. So in the US, uh, you know, hiring as an independent contractor is very easy. At the end of the tax year, you're at the beginning of the relationship. You get them to sign a W-9. At the end of the tax year, you issue a 1099. The flow is pretty simple. Although legal clauses change from one government to the, sorry, one state to the other, so like California actually just released a new regulation called AB5, which makes it a little harder and you need to be a bit more wary. Um, new Jersey is doing the same and it's kind of changing, right? Thanks to the, the Ubers of the world. But as soon as you start hiring in a different country, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so, you know, to give you a few examples, uh, in France, like I told you, there's five different types of structure that um, auto entrepreneur that a contractor might be using. And based on the structure they, they pick, the documents they're required to, to gather are different. And it might sound trivial, but if you as a person, or as a company, sorry, are paying someone that doesn't have the right structure or doesn't have a structure at all, which technically, you know, very pragmatically today, you have no idea, right? Why would you know what are the different structures and the different ways to get paid in France? But it's basically as if you as a company would, would give some cash to someone somewhere. Uh, and that's obviously illegal. And the way you need to think of it is, even though it is their problem, because on paper, when you're hiring as an independent contractor, they're a business serving you down the line, if something happens, you would be the one responsible as you're the one that's making the payment. So having an understanding of how local laws and how local structures work is pretty crucial when working with someone. 
So, what? so I was talking a little more about regulation. So because of that, uh, of that change of this globalization in general and more and more companies like ours or ARC hiring people around the world, there's kind of two sides to the story. There is uh, countries like Serbia, uh, we actually have a Serbian team member uh, and what they see is they see their talent working for other countries and in other companies. And they don't really like that. So what they decided to do is to start putting different regulations to really understand what's going on and to make sure when you're working as an independent contractor, you really are an independent contractor. The reason behind that is pretty simple, right? I, I'm, as a US company, I'm hiring someone in Serbia. I'm paying less taxes because they're not an employee in that specific case, but an independent contractor. And they're paying sometimes the same, sometimes less taxes, but more importantly, they, in, they expense a lot of things because they're their own business. So, you know, the only loser in that relationship most of the times are the governments and they don't really like that. Then you have different rules. So the same thing is happening in the UK, it's called IR35. Uh, and some countries are freaking out so badly about it that they actually fired a lot of their staff. And then you have a different aspect to it, which is a little more AB5, which, you know, I personally still think it comes down to taxes. Uh, but, you know, the idea here is that companies like Uber that are just doing independent contracting at scale are abusing the system. I, I don't really believe that's the, the core reason why um, in that specific case, the government is going uh, after and in introducing AB5, but you know, this is how they, they're framing it today. So those regulations are actually happening at a worldwide level, which means as more and more people hire outside of their country, they should be aware of what's going on there when making that hire. And they should make sure to the best of their knowledge, I'll say that they're doing it right. And that's really what's called risk mitigations. So on the compliance side, you know, I could talk for hours. There's lots of things you can do within the contract. There's lots of things you can do within understanding the structure of the, of the contractor. Uh, and it's really important to do that because you know, that's the feedback we get quite often is, well, you know, I'm, my contract, even my deal contract is based on my local jurisdiction, right? I'm a US client, I'm based in the US. My contract state that uh, the, the governing law is a US law. But what happens is in lots of cases, if there was any trouble towards the, the government or the contractors themselves, uh, it's totally within their rights to, to want to dispute the contract within their country. And if that happens, just the cost of the lawyer flying or finding the right person there makes the whole idea completely, completely crazy. Um, so focusing a little bit on the payment side, uh, when you have lots of people around the world, uh, and I, I think it's very different from one country to the other, uh, but since uh, we're a bit more US focused in general, I'll say I'll start with the US as a scenario. So what most of the companies and some of the biggest companies actually that we've talked to do is they just issue a wire transfer at the end of the month or at the end of a cycle, whenever they pay their team. And that's really not a great experience, right? Let, let's take a very pragmatic example. If I'm based in India or in the Philippines and my client is paying me from their US account, uh, the payment will go through what's called SWIFT. So SWIFT, uh, you know, long story short, going through, the payment will go through inter intermediary banks and the fee will be between 20 to $60 and the payment will take quite a bit of time. And when it gets to my account as someone in India, what happens is my bank will do the conversion from the currency of the client to, you know, ENR in the case of India. And banks are not exactly known for the best FX fees. <laughs> so they really give you uh, a head of a fee and make you have a really poor experience. So that's when you introduce different payment methods. In some cases you have no choice, right? Like going through Swift is the best solution because it's really complicated um, to go any other way. In others, you have different solutions. So, you know, TransferWise, which is actually one of Deal's payment partner, actually every single payment provider you see here is a payment partner of Deal, uh, will give you the ability to, to pay your team, assuming you've done all the compliance right, make them the transfer uh, at a very, at a much cheaper cost. Uh, and, you know, without pitching what TransferWise do, what is, you know, overall what they do is they, they just, uh, instead of making the wire transfer, they'll just tell their account in India to send locally money to, that in, to your Indian uh, teammates. Um, and that's a lot faster. You know, turnaround time would be one day instead of three or five days, and it's a lot, lot less expensive. I and mean, then you've got other solutions like uh, Revolut, which is a, which is a, a great company and, and does FX really well, and some other uh, uh, companies like Pioneer, which allows you to pay in 
they are very complicated countries to pay into, and eventually PayPal, which uh, cost a lot of money, but still, you know, a lot of people like using. So, really, what it comes down to, if if you want to give a good experience to your teammates, don't do a wire transfer into their currency, but dig a little more into it. Um, and and try you want to give them the same experience as if you were paying someone in try us or in try europe which is really easy so it's usually worth digging uh, a little into so really the key takeaways is that if, if you really want to hire someone outside of your country uh, and I, i'm you know i really believe i have a very different stance on remote work uh, i think uh, I'll, I'll jump on those in, in, a, in a few seconds, but I, I have a very different uh, stance of remote work. Like I, I do think it's really great to work from home, to work from anywhere. Uh, but my view on this is if if someone's right for your company and if someone has the right skill set to build what you need to be building and there's a culture fit, I don't think locations should matter. And I think you should be open to bringing on that person wherever they are. So, so given that perspective, uh, what you should keep in mind is if you can open a subsidiary, if you've got the overhead to do that, do it. Um, if you want to deal with a third party, but want to do this a little right, and don't don't really mind paying another 20, 30 percent on top of what you're paying. And, you know, maybe working with PO is a good solution for you. And you know, there are some up, up and coming ones. Uh, I haven't seen anyone yet that's actually worth the trouble. Um, but if you do want to work with them as independent contractors, you really need to make sure you do it right. And it might seem small, it might seem like something that you, you know, oh, let's just ignore for now and hope for the best. But um, one, sometimes you get unlucky and you're the one that gets audited or something something happens. Two, you know, when hiring as a contractor, there's lots of rules uh, that happens there and not just the ones we talked about, but even in terms of uh, IP rights, which you know, could frighten or be a problem if you were to raise further money uh, towards your investors and things like that. So figuring that out early is the best way to do it well. Um, so I would really be careful and, uh, you know, obviously this is something we help with, but if, if you don't go that path, like go get a local advisor, uh, talk to someone that really understands that specific use case and make sure you nail it so that it doesn't, you know, bite back later. Um, then the second part is you know, usually a bit more complicated, but really worth it. Uh, if you do want to give a great experience to your team, uh, usually, money uh, is a good way to show them you care and taking the time to figuring out what is the best way to to get them their really hard earned salary uh, is usually worth every piece of investment uh, so you can manually do that uh, that's that's one of the steps and yes in general you know something very important that i guess i didn't talk about uh, but you can see it shine through those those new regulations is that as globalization happen and as low changes for example Argentina and Serbia are changing their law right now. So you kind of need to be on top of that because the work you're doing today might be worth less tomorrow if a new government comes into place or a new role is, in, is actually added to, to, to that specific scenario. Um, cool. So wait, do you want to jump back in? Should we answer some questions? Is there a preferred method for the ones you listed? Um, so I'm just gonna answer those three questions first. Is there a preferred method from the ones you listed? It's, it's very different, right? It's based on, on the currency and on the person you're working with. So for example, I deal like we have TransferWise because for the Philippines and for India, they do a really, really great job, but we also integrated like DLocal and Pioneer. DLocal is like really, really good for Latin America, right? Brazilian Real and COP, which are not supported by most of the payment providers are only there. So. The, what you need to do is you need to spend a little bit of time understanding different costs and understanding how the delivery time of the money is gonna, how long it's gonna be, and then figure out what's the best with your team. It might take a few hit and miss uh, with them to, to get it right. And what's my perspective on Stripe to handle payment? Uh, do, do you mean Stripe Connect? Because Stripe doesn't handle payments that way. They do disperse with their Connect API, but it's, it's not really a payroll tool. Um, I, I guess it's possible for Maya to 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 be referring to Stripe Connect because I guess we also heard of some companies using Stripe Connect to pay um, people potentially domestically in the US. I'm not sure if I mean. Yeah, yeah. The Stripe is more. I mean, Stripe is cool. Uh, we we use them for pay-ins actually, uh, but I mean they're 
they do do 1099s. They do do some tax compliance when it comes to within the US. Uh, but like, I, I don't really think of Stripe for for a marketplace, maybe you know, for a team of like 50, 100, 150 people. I don't think it really makes sense. And they kind of disperse the money through ACH, which is kind of the same thing as at the end of the day, making making those the SWIFT transfer, right? It's not a localized payment for your teammates. So it's, it's usually not the best experience, but uh, this might be something you can live with. Uh, I mean, what's the best way to evaluate if it's the right time to open a subsidiary while building collocated teams? Uh, this is really a, a very personal decision. Uh, I personally hate opening subsidiaries. And I will avoid it at all cost. Uh, one rule of thumb is if you start having too many people in a country, uh, then you, you know, it varies. Uh, so we've seen some of our specific customers, uh, for example, in Canada, where, you know, the, the Canadian government came knocking after 10 people. Uh, but then we have customers with a few hundred people in some countries as well. So it, it's very much a, it's a question of how risk averse you are. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of having subsidiaries because I, Opening them is a problem, and then you're opening your, yourself to more risk. And obviously, then when you when you do have a subsidiary, then you need to move everybody as employees, which is not exactly the same the same overhead in terms of accounting and dealing and even even price at the end of the day and payments uh, than what you currently have. Um, Alex, can you also share? You mentioned about some of the alternatives to starting a local subsidiary. What does the cost? How do when? What are these like? What are the ballpark in terms of the cost? In terms of maybe using a local P, a global PO or collocating? So uh, let's first start with most of the really good global PEOs because I like, think Manpower, right? Manpower is a huge company. The overhead of working and the cost of working and onboarding someone as an employee is so high for them that most of them will not even want to work with you when you only have a couple of people. Right. It's just too expensive to even set it up to start with. Uh, now, now some of the smaller PEOs, right, the up and coming ones, uh, you know, there, there's a couple great ones that are kind of up and coming, like Geo and Remote. Like, yeah, maybe they'll take the overhead at the beginning because they're still small and they're trying to get customers and, and they want to get those ones. Again, I, I'm not exactly a big fan of PEOs generally, uh, and I, I like the alternatives, right? Like if you look at a Papaya Global, right, that uh, is a marketplace for PEO and matches you with local expert there, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, depending on your stage, it, it's just a matter of how risk coverage you are, right? It's like either you hire someone as an independent contractor and you do it right, as, as right as you can until you can't really anymore, or you do it right from the get-go uh, and open a subsidiary. And then the cost themselves, it depends on the country, right? You have the legal cost of opening the company, the lawyers, the contracts for the employment, opening the bank account, accounting at the end of the year, uh, maintaining the structure. Like the, there is some cost involved to it. But if, if you're going to invest in a country and hire like hundreds of people there, then I think you should open a company. Um, CA to New Jersey's contractor law. So I haven't personally dived into the New Jersey's contractor law, but there is a new regulation. Uh, I, can, I can send it to you at the end of the call. I forget the exact name of it, but there's a new regulation that just came up in New Jersey um, in the last few weeks that's basically equivalent to AB5. Uh, but if you leave your email, I can ask our, our local lawyers in both states to, to give you a precise answer on, on the difference. I know the contracts are different. Can you share particularly a horror story about naming a specific company? Well, I mean, I, we have a couple in-house. But uh, I guess a story that most people don't know is that in my case, uh, I, I was brought up in a, in a family where uh, my family company was, was in a couple of countries. Um, it's an IPO company in, uh, in over 25 countries and um, they got sued in every country <laughs> for contractor hiring uh, by the contractors or by the government themselves. So um, very pragmatically, I guess you could Google that specific name, but uh, in countries like France, for example, uh, you will lose every time if you don't get it right, 100%. Uh, the Crudum, which is the name of there, and Yourself, which is just you know the IRS equivalent and is waiting to make money, <laughs> uh, will definitely get you every single time there. Uh, and since you're asking, yes, particular countries uh, with complicated hiring regulations, France is definitely up there. Uh, most European countries, so like France, um, Spain, but Spain has some really cool laws where you can, like, I mean, without diving too much into it, you can basically become an autonomous contractor, a dependent contractor. So you can be affiliated to one company without really being 
uh, an employee. Uh, so all the, but they really like look at every single detail if you actually use that that uh, that exemption. But Spain, Germany, France are pretty tough. Uh, Brazil is actually really tough as well. Um, and some countries um, from the contractor side ties the invoices to the actual government website. Um, so on those like Brazil and Portugal, you really, really need to get the structure and the like, rights of work things really right. And uh, is California's new AB5 law going to make California tough as well? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's the point of the law. We'll see. Like uh, the thing in California, the lucky part of California is you've got the big companies fighting against it, right? So when it happens in Serbia, it's a different story. But when Uber and Lyft and uh, most of the 1099s uh, companies are threatened and they're, you know, I think, I think they're suing the the government on that specific law. Um, I haven't dived that much into that part, but. Uh, at least something's gonna happen there. Um, uh, but you've got the big sharks fighting for those rights, so you know, it might go a little better. Um, yeah, it is all of that. Uh, Ninan is right, right? It is all of this. Um, and a lot of the time, right, if you're gonna go to India, you also need a full-time accountant to do your taxes and everything there, right? It's not like the US where you have gusto and you press a button or rippling and you press a button and everything is done. Uh, or the the you know the likes of like pilot that does all your accounting in some of those countries if you open a company the accounting is going to be heavy and there's no software I mean you can go and build it but there's no real software to help you there. Um, you said you know, someone found things. Uh, I had a legal background more than a financial background. Um, I mean it depends how. Pragmatically, if you have a, you're not going to have a labor lawyer on your team, right? Most of the time, that doesn't happen. So, um, what in our case we do, right? Because that's what we do all day. All day. But in 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 your case, as a, as a smaller team, usually the CEO should stay on top of that, uh, and or maybe the operations person or HR. Uh, but I don't think you'll have you, you don't. It, it will obviously be better to have a legal background person on the team looking at it, but I, I think it's not at most companies, even at a couple hundred uh, people on the team, I don't think they'll have time to really look into that. And it's so far away from them that they, you know, it just slips through and it's been six months since you're doing it wrong and you didn't even notice. Um, um, there's a question from Alice yes. about is there, I guess, is there any way yeah. for, to leverage cryptocurrency as a solution to, uh, to do cost order yeah. payments? I mean, to do the payments themselves, sure, but uh, it, I mean, if, from a compliance perspective, if you're paying someone, it needs to be declared. Whether it's like crypto or not crypto, it doesn't really matter. Sure, the costs are lower if it's in business, if it's in Bitcoin, but there's still the thing is the structure, they need to be paying their taxes, right? They need to be actually allowed to receive that money. And in a lot of the countries um, in Eastern Europe and stuff like that, it's a lot harder to get payments in crypto, um, or at least using it, or a lot of them you know, don't actually really declare their payments. So here, if you're paying someone in crypto, you can be assured that there is a high likeliness. Um, he won't be reporting his taxes the right way. Um, now, now we're, for example, integrating crypto in deal right now. Uh, I mean, with some boundaries to it, uh, just because of uh, US regulations, but you can technically pay someone with crypto and it does solve some, some of the payment cost, I guess. Um, but you know, this is a pure analysis. And if you're getting paid in India and uh, you know, transfer wise costs like X, and if you're paying someone in Ether or in Bitcoin and it costs Y, and then the, the price of changing that currency back home adds another like Delta that makes it the same as, as what you would have gotten if you would have been in local currency, then it might not be worth it. Um, so yeah, but hiring people in the US yeah, it, it is pretty complicated. It's not something we deal with uh, and it's not something we solve, but uh, what you usually need to do is find a local PEO, a US PEO that can basically do all of that work with you. Um, so we work pretty closely with a PEO called Sequoia, sequoia.com. Uh, I'm super happy to make you an intro if you want. This is literally what they do all day. Uh, they, they, will, they will do that bit for you. If you're going to do it yourself, it can really go crazy. Yeah, just to speak to that a little bit. I recall the founder of Bear Metrics. Um, I think he tweeted um, a, a while ago about getting fined by some states in the US, even though they were using 
appeal like just works to pay for those remote employees like still domestically based in the us um i'm not sure do you have any insight into that the truth is i really haven't dealt into like because this, this is more employee hiring right you're hiring them as employees uh and, and this is not something we deal with too much um what I know is there's lots of things at stake and every single state, uh, by the way, this, this gives you an idea of uh, if every single state has it has different ways to deal with those. Imagine how every single country uh, do it. But yes, generally, yeah, generally I, what I've seen people do most of the time, which, which just, you know, just work does that. But I think uh, I think Sequoia apparently does it really well. Uh, and this is really their bread and butter is basically streamlining all of this within the US for you. And uh, being the PEO, they take a lot of those risks. Uh, it, it's always the same thing, right? Uh, working with a PEO is working with a third party that hires people for you. Right? It's not exactly ideal. Uh, and I, I personally avoid it when I can, but uh, if it's the best way to do it, then you, know, you might want to look into that. All right. Um, is there any resources that you can direct the audience to if they want to learn more about certain rules for certain countries around the globe? Um, so the complexity here is that it depends on the country, right? Some countries don't even have materials in English about this. Uh, and, uh, we do write content about this. Uh, and we, I think in the last few weeks, we've shipped a couple of articles about how to do it right in like Belgium and France and things like that. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, if you really want to get it right, it, it's not too hard, uh, to, to start digging. You just need to start researching, uh, and understand. You need to talk to your to your teammate first. How are they set up, and how do how are they planning on doing it? Because based on the setup they have, the answer might be different. Um, so after understanding that, you can start googling and researching. Uh, but again, like the, the the better advice is get a local lawyer or come and use Deal. We have over 120 local lawyers in each one of those countries, uh, and this is what we do all day. Uh, that said, you know, good resources. If you have any questions on this. Uh, Come talk to us. Uh, we're basically on you know, in Intercom 24-7. Come ask us questions, and we're happy to refer you to any of our local partners, and they can give you some insights on that specific country, and you can maybe you know can maybe help you set up the right way. If you think you haven't been hiring completely, what's the first thing you should do to start making things right? Um, you need to. Well, it depends how big your company is, how spread out your company is. Uh, but you need to start going and talking to local advisors in each one of those countries. Uh, you also need to talk to your teammates and understand how are they set up uh, because that will be pretty key in general. You'd be surprised. Sometimes they're not set up at all. <laughs> and that's when you know you've done it really, really wrong. Uh, but yeah, I would get a local advisor in all of those countries and I'll try to understand for every specific use case what is the best way to do it. Um, and you know, make a make a gut call on what is the best system to do it as well. Whether it's you know, PEO or international contracting or uh, or switch. You know, for example, some of the companies we talk to uh, and we have even as customers, uh, they know they have been doing it wrong for a while, and they I mean you know, the CEO might not care, but the CFO or the, or the GC is uh, is crying at night trying to think how is he going to solve it. And some of them just say, okay, we don't want to take any risk anymore. We'll just move to a PEO, right? And, and it can work. Or again, you know, you can hit us up and we'll make sure to mitigate your risk as much as you can. And, and mitigate is actually really important, right? What Deal does, working with independent contractors is not removing the risk, right? It's mitigate, there is a risk and doing it right mitigates your risk. But there is a point where based on the number of people or based on the, the length of the relationship or things like that, where you might want to think, okay, you know, I've done, I've stayed gray area for as much as I can, specifically for someone that's really full time and working full on and maybe even getting equity. And you might want to, you might want to think of a different way. Or, you know, if you want to do this the most mitigated way possible, it's getting all those documents, getting those localized contracts and taking all those steps. Um, you can use a Yeah, you can do that. It's just, it's just a big headache. Uh, Ninan's right. Like, yeah, I'm sure, Paul, you might already be doing that. It's just, yeah, it, it is a bit crazy to handle. Um, if the company is based in California and the contractors are in another state, does California AB5 come into play? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, I, but I can check back with our local consultant. Paul, I think to the best of our knowledge, uh, 
if the contractors are not in California, then AB5 is actually not applicable. Yeah, I think it's only, I also think that way, right? It's only Californian contractors. But you're gonna have a B five equivalent in every state by yeah. within the next few years anyway. So. Yeah. So as of right now, it's more applicable to I guess the giants such as Uber and Lyft and DoorDash. All these I guess because they no. operate locally. So I guess company in um, in California, the ta- the the gig workers are also in California, so it's very applicable. But I think if you are someone yeah. who is based in California but trying to hire. Um, a remote worker, say in Seattle, for example, as of right now, I guess the, 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 the regulation is more tied towards the regulations in the state of Washington, rather in California. Yeah, yeah. if you definitely have a double exposure, if you're a Californian company hiring in California. Yes. Yeah. That, that was a great question. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Or Alex, do you have any final words of, of advice for us? Um, well, you know, I, I'd say that it, this shouldn't be a barrier to remote hiring. And yeah, this is how it would end. Uh, there's, there's great companies that are working on it all day to solve those problems and make it easy. And, you know, through software and through heavy operations and, and dealing with uh, all those countries, though, uh, we'll, we'll kind of get through it and we'll, we'll do our best to get those setups done. So if you, again, if you want to work with people internationally, whether whatever your reasons are, whether it's cost, whether it's talent, whether it's uh, just the right person there, um, it sh- compliance shouldn't be the reason you don't do it. And, but you should have it right. Uh, and you should think about it and, and, try your best to not be in jeopardy in in a couple you know one one two years uh, after making that move yeah so as alex referred like the remote ecosystem is growing pretty drastically and we are having great companies such as deal and arc working to iron out all these complexities for hiring remotely so yeah um, i think there's a final question uh, from christina uh, yeah, I can introduce you to the guys at Sequoia. I haven't worked with them personally, but uh, the dozen people I refer to them uh, whenever they come and say, hey, can you help us with a PO service within the US uh, seem to be happy. Um, so I'm happy to say, I think we've got your email from the question earlier about New Jersey versus California. Sure, uh, we'll shoot you a note. And Anya has got your email and we'll, we'll make you an intro to the, to the right guys there. Great, yeah. And if, so thank you so much for attending the webinar. This is great. So. For anyone out there, if you have any further questions, you can reach out to myself at ARC and deal at lessdeal.com. Um, Alex and his team can be reached out at hey at lessdeal.com. You can actually email me personally at w at arc.dev and visit us at arc.dev. Thank you so much. Yeah, likewise. Alex at lessdeal.com. And uh, we, we pride ourselves in 24 7 customer support. Absolutely. So if you guys have it. If you guys have any questions, please uh, please come talk to us directly and we'll be happy to help. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day.